everyone. Thank you for tuning in to the Postmodern Realities Podcast, brought to you by the Christian Research Institute and the Christian Research Journal. I'm Melanie Cogdill, Managing Editor of the Christian Research Journal. It's April 2022, and this is episode 284, which is a conversation about a New York Times opinion piece called Anti-Abortion Groups Once Portrayed Women as Victims, That's Changing, by Mary Ziegler, who is a law professor at Florida State University and a visiting professor at Harvard Law School. On this episode, I'm joined by my guest, Jay Watts, who is the founder and president of Merrily Human Ministries, Inc., an organization founded to equip Christians and pro-life advocates to defend the intrinsic dignity of all human life. Jay has written an online exclusive article in response to this New York Times opinion piece for the Christian Research Journal, and his article is called, What Attorney Mary Ziegler Gets Wrong About Pro-Life Tactics. You can read it at our website, equip.org, for free if you're a subscriber to our journal. If you don't already subscribe, you can get all online access to exclusives at our website once you subscribe, which you can do at equip.org. Jay, it's good to have you on. It's great to be back. Well, today, as I mentioned, we're going to be talking about an op-ed piece that was published by the New York Times called Anti-Abortion Groups Once Portrayed Women as Victims. That's Changing by Mary Ziegler. And it is interesting, Jay and I were just talking about, because of the decisions that are going to be coming Along in the courts this summer, it seems to me that there's a huge concerted effort to basically discredit the pro-life movement in any way that they can, especially with opinion pieces in a lot of media outlets. So at the beginning of her article, she writes this, quote, with Roe v. Wade on thin ice, state legislatures are producing a wave of anti-abortion bills some of them truly eye-popping. Missouri alone has in recent weeks tried to limit out-of-state travel for abortion, proposed treating the delivery or shipment of abortion pills as drug trafficking, and moved to make it a felony to perform an abortion in the event of an ectopic pregnancy in which a fertilized egg implants outside the womb, a condition that can be life-threatening. In the past, many extreme bills like this would have captured the public's attention and then quickly disappeared swept under the rug by lawmakers and abortion opponents who had easier to enact plans for dismantling abortion rights. The past year has been different in a few ways. For one, some fringe bills are actually going into effect. So this is really interesting. So has the United States seen a wave of pro-life legislation as the country prepares for the possible reversal of Roe v. Wade and Planned Parenthood versus Casey as Ziegler claims in her opinion piece? It has in the sense of we're talking about proposals and, and it's not just by the way, pro-life it's both sides. And if, I think if I have one serious complaint about this particular piece, and I have a lot, I mean, just to what you read right there, there were so many things that were difficult to accept from someone as educated as Mary Ziegler, but the idea that she kind of myopically focuses on how the pro-life movement is doing things and she sees no connection to it in regards to what the other side, abortion advocacy side is doing. And what I mean by that is if you look at the idea of proposed legislation and the numbers of proposed legislation that, that we have seen, we have, let's say by her own link, by the way, this is the data that's collected in a link that she provides to support her claims, introduced restrictions There have been 529 in 41 states. So that is a lot. That is a lot of introduced restrictions. The number of those restrictions that passed one chamber in the state where they were introduced goes down to 48 in in just 13 states. If you go to what's actually been enacted, we go all the way down to nine in five states. So the idea that a lot of people are introducing bills into state houses and states, that's true. That the idea that this is a sweeping thing that's happening and being enacted. That is not true. And to get the other side of that, by the way, the people who tracked this and the Guttmacher Institute posted this total number of bills that were introduced relating to this under two categories, one which we would call proactive measures, which they endorse, and one which they would call restrictive. Remember I said 529 restrictive measures have been introduced. 1,355 proactive measures have been introduced. So this isn't the case where pro-life legislation is sweeping the nation or restrictive measures are sweeping the nation. 
what you're seeing is what you mentioned er a second ago, this idea that as we get closer to Dobbs versus Jackson decision coming down, everybody on both sides is doing everything they can to create a state environment that will take effect the second that national decision has been made. So they're not scrambling to do things after the fact. Is it true, as Ziegler claims, that, for example, the state of Missouri moved to make it a felony to perform an abortion in the event of an ectopic pregnancy, which she notes that it can be a potentially life-threatening medical condition for women. So that sounds rather draconian. Is that true? Yeah, it would be horrible if it were true. It, I mean, it would be a terrible thing if it were actually true. And and the evidence that is often offered in these I, I cannot encourage people enough to follow links, to follow links in all of these things that are offered. They link to the measure itself when you read it, and it does have strange wording that is difficult to parse through. So I went for further evidence from their side to, to find out where they were getting the idea of what this was. And I went to a bunch of tweets that had been sent out saying that this was happening, immediately responding to the tweets where people from Missouri clarifying that this is not saying that if you treat a tubal ectopic pregnancy, you will be prosecuted as a felony for a legal abortion. This is aimed specifically at pharmacies that are, are, are that are providing RU46 or the, the abortion regimen through medicine. And what they're trying to target in this isn't tubal ectopic pregnancy treatment as a whole, but in the case where telemedicine measures or just mailing measures are used for people to receive abortion medicine through the mail, and no effort has been made by any medical doctor to examine the woman, and she has a tubal ectopic pregnancy, which increases risk when they use of damage in, to the woman in this particular case. If a woman is harmed in this instance, and you provided her with the abortion medicine without determining whether she had an ectopic pregnancy or not, then the pharmacy or those who provided the medicine are in trouble. It's not the treatment of tubal ectopic pregnancies, which, by the way, when you talk to OBGYNs, pro-life OBGYNs, they say that's not an abortion. We don't talk about tubal ectopic pregnancy treatment as an abortion. This is saving life where we can save life. And this has been a, there's a long history of, of discussion about how we philosophically parse through this. But this particular measure is aimed at those people that would provide medicine without determining the medical condition of the woman they're giving it to. And then that woman is hurt through this process. So... That's why I, th I think it's sloppy and dangerous, right? I mean, it's sloppy in the way that they go about sharing that information. And I think dangerous because that miss but she's a, she's a lawyer. She, even if she were sloppy enough to believe that that was what the law was doing, the fact that the representative who, who put that law forward has already publicly said immediately when those criticisms came out, representative Brian cites that he is amending the language to clarify what's actually happening. That ought to prevent them from continuing to print this particular misunderstanding or lie, whichever way you want to look at it. Well, it's very interesting when you read this article, and I will quote from it again before I ask you the next question, because like I said, it really paints the pro-life movement as rather devious. Okay, so she writes this, quote, some of this new crop of bills reflect a change in how the anti-abortion movement portrays such women depicting them as serious criminals rather than innocent victims of the, quote, abortion industry, end quote, as was common in the past. That rhetorical and legal shift sends a powerful message about who is likely to face criminal punishment when Roe's dismantled, as it is expected to be this summer, end quote. So do some of these bills actually treat women seeking abortions as serious criminals, as Ziegler states? Because that is quite a charge to say that. Yeah. And now, again, the idea of some and the bills proposed, remember if you, the number of bills that were 529 in 41 states, there are people within the, which, and some of them will, by the way, if you're talking about like the group that called themselves abortion abolitionists, they reject the idea of being pro-life at all. So let's give them their own category because they say they're not pro-lifers. Abortion abolitionists, are very passionate about language that says that a woman who gets an abortion has committed murder and that she ought to be prosecuted. And oftentimes they can influence legislatures to put for legislators, particular legislators, specific people to put forth that legislation on the floor. It doesn't get very far, 
But sure, those proposals have been made. This is not a large part of the movement. As a matter of fact, I said, they, they don't even count themselves as what they would consider pro-life. And then there's other people that are sympathetic to that view who would count themselves as pro-life who do fall into that category, but overwhelmingly, no. I mean, they're, they're sure there's going to be some proposed. There have been some proposed that have some frightening language in it, but those don't get anywhere. And they're not a part of the 48 and 13 states that got through one house. And they're certainly never going to be a part of the nine that were enacted. And so t- when you say some, right, that's there's some trickiness there to that because some can mean one. So there isn't a broad movement to to paint the women who are getting abortions as murderers and to prosecute them as such. There are people out there. And so some is accurate to that sense, but not something that's ever going to get into law anywhere as, as, as far as we can see at this point. We are running a brand new giveaway for our listeners. And this giveaway ends June 30th, 2022. And This giveaway is, of course, for a free subscription to the Christian Research Journal anywhere in the world. And in addition, if you live in the United States, if you win this giveaway, you will get these additional swag bonuses of four different books. The first one is called Doubts About Darwin. The second and third one are actual hardcover books of the best of the Christian Research Journal. One is called What is Truth? The other one is called Whose Ethics, Whose Morals? And just kind of classic apologetics articles from our archives. And then the final one is called Cultural Apologetics, Renewing the Christian Voice, Conscience, and Imagination in a Disenchanted World by Paul Gould. And of course, as you know, in the Postmodern Realities podcast, we do cover a bunch of cultural apologetics. So that will be a great equipping book. And so here's how you enter. In order to enter, you just go on to Apple Podcasts. I know it takes a moment to just sign in there, but you give us a written review. It can be really short, just one sentence, one or two sentences, just a few words about why you like to listen to this podcast. And that enters you in because we'll do a drawing from all of the names or handles that are on there. And anyone that's been entering from the beginning of this contest through June 30th will receive one entry and we will spin the wheel and someone will win this prize. So please do go on there because as you do so and you write us a review, it's a way in which you can help other people who have the similar interest of you in cultural apologetics and apologetics to find this podcast. Now, of course, we're always grateful for the other ways you help us, which is just get the word out there. Simply tell a friend about this podcast or share one of your favorite episodes on your social media accounts or email it to a friend or however you want to get it out there. We just really appreciate your partnership with us. The other thing is, of course, we'd love for you to subscribe to our journal. We are continuing to try to grow our subscription base. And what you get for your subscription is all the print issues directly to your door, plus all the online exclusives that we have on our website that you hear about in these podcast episodes. So give us a subscription would be great. Also as a gift to a friend, if you already subscribe, or if a subscription is not in your budget right now, please, we would ask that you consider giving us a tip. I mean, $3 or $5 giving up one of your favorite coffees for the week at your favorite coffee shop and giving us a tip to help us bring you this content. So thank you. Ziegler is also claiming that the motivation, you know, for the original shift in tone is really a way for the pro-life movement to deal with this image crisis that's been created because of violence against abortion providers and clinic blockades. And so do you think that's accurate on her part? Yeah, she, she's pointing back into the late 90s, right, where we had this rush, like thinking back to the Olympics, the 96 Olympics here in Atlanta, where I live, and Eric Rudolph and the things that he had done, not just in the Olympics, but against abortion clinics and obviously the murder of abortionists and then the Operation Rescue Movement that would would provide blockades. And she was saying that the shift was because as if this were some appeal to a, a firm somewhere to talk about what can we do to market ourselves better. And they said, you have an image problem, an image problem that has been born out of the people seeing you as violent and blockading and aggressive. And so you need to change how you talk about it. That's that's not really how it went down. To some degree it is, but what happened was, and she actually links in her story an article or an essay that was written by Dr. John Wilkie and his wife, Barbara, 
originally entitled We Can Love Them Both, I believe. And in there, he details their change or shift back in 1997. And he said that as the pro-choice side, as the abortion advocate side shifted their language to focus on women and, and tried their best to get it off of what, what, what it was that was being destroyed to the act of abortion, then they found that audiences were less receptive to talking about what the child was without recognition of that the woman needed sympathy as well for the condition that she found herself in and what was driving her to feel like she had to get an abortion. Now, here's the important thing. What they said they were pivoting towards was not a new marketing scheme or a new tactic. It was informing the public of the measures that had already been taken by the pro-life movement to address the needs of women. Even at that time, the, the number of pregnancy resource centers far outnumbered the number of right to life organizations, people in the communities were already reaching out to these women that were in health. So it wasn't a tactical switch to start lying. What it was is, is it moved away from it and started to say, well, we can show compassion to both. It was a recognition of what has always existed within the pro-life movement, but what wasn't being seen. And those tactics aren't just being left behind because they were uh, not pretty. I mean, obviously nobody in the pro-life movement ever encouraged the killing of, uh, the, I mean, if you go look anytime any violence is done against a human being involved in the abortion industry, every legitimate pro-life organization I've ever seen immediately condemns it. So that, we're about treating all human beings with dignity and respect and against the murder of all in that sense. But, but also you saw different tactics rising up with, with guys like Greg Cunningham at center for bioethical reform. At the same time, you see the Wilkies shifting their message you see Greg Cunningham saying, I don't think that blockades are working because unlike, say, a sit-in during the civil rights movement where the injustice against the black men and women that were performing the sit-in was obviously drawn out and seen by everybody through the act of the sit-in, blockading an abortion clinic doesn't demonstrate the injustice of abortion because we still can't see the victims. And so a focus on the victims then goes in another direction on showing abortion victim photography and those those different things like that. And so the shift in tactics isn't an, uh, like a, it's a cynical way to look at it, right? We had an image problem and we got to figure out a way to deal with it. In reality, what happened was they realized that the audience had changed. And so the audience needed to be informed of measures that already existed and that some of the tactics they were using at that time weren't working because they didn't demonstrate the injustice of abortion clearly enough to the general public. And so they switched to other tactics. And so th those tactics and the difference and the change of, of message was a result of the changing nature of both the opposition and abortion advocacy and the audience and how they received messages. And everyone has to be mindful of how audiences change. You have to change how you talk to audiences as they change how they hear messages. Siegler also writes this, quote, the movement had a constitutional problem too, the pro-life movement she's referring to. In 1992, the Supreme Court in Planned Parenthood versus Casey defied expectations by refusing to reverse Roe v. Wade in its entirety. And as a result, anti-abortion groups concluded that Roe would never be overturned unless the majority of the Supreme Court justices no longer believed that women needed abortion to be equal. The simplest solution, as anti-abortion leaders saw it, was to prove that abortion actually harmed the women it was supposed to help. So is this also another approach at undermining abortion rights because of what happened in 1992 with the Casey decision? No. I mean, I mean, I think it's obviously true that the idea of abortion harming women becomes something at that point. But it, again, it's a cynical approach to believe that it was a, a me, it was an approach that was designed because we had a constitutional problem. I mean, to some degree or another, some part of that play comes into play. But that comes more as we start to doubt the ability of the court. Because remember, wasn't the ninety two court was supposed to have been stacked with people that were put into office or put into the the court by Reagan and Bush that were going to do this job for us. They were conservatives that were committed to this principle. And they were going to overturn Roe v. Wade. And when they didn't, it called into question the tactic of trying to stack the court with conservative justices. And so there was a change at that point and a constitutional problem. But the idea of abortion hurting women came about because there are people who genuinely believe that abortion was harming women. And, and it, it, it was a, sort of an organic growth. One of them came you know, from the, you know, often argued about the, the abortion causes uh, breast cancer or a link to abortion and breast cancer link. But that was that argument was starting to happen and starting to grow. There was also the awareness that there are women that were struggling 
with uh, after abortion pain and, and trauma that they were dealing with the memory of it and what they had done. And this was not just oftentimes it's cast or, or categorized as something that happens to religious women. Uh, but that's not entirely so. There's a woman by the name of Linda Curry, who is right now, I believe she works at the University of St. Mary at the lake. Uh, and and she and I've, I've heard her speak and I've talked to her. She's a lovely person. She used to be an atheist who worked with Planned Parenthood. And after she had an abortion, she struggled with years for, from guilt for it and, and kept seeking counseling, trying to figure out why she was struggling with it. The reason that she ultimately starts to gravitate towards Catholicism is because she went to see a Catholic counselor who was talking to her about it. And she shared what had happened. And she said that the counselor said, well, what you did was wrong. She said, that's the first time anybody had ever said that to me. So nobody ever said what you did was wrong. But if everybody kept telling me that everything that I did was a right that I had. And, and so I felt what was wrong was me feeling badly about it. She said she was finally set free when somebody said it was wrong, because that makes sense why she feels bad because what she did was wrong. And so she's not the only woman that's going through this. And so as we become aware that there are all of these women that are going through this and they're dealing with this pain, the psychological pain and emotional pain from a memory of a past action they committed against their unborn. So the idea that abortion hurts women comes from that. Is this awareness that there's all these women that w- want to be restored to a healthy psychological relationship and ways and man's means that we can to help them to do that. So it's again, it's not the idea that there was a political shift and a constitutional shift. And so we have to find a new argument. And that new argument is abortion hurts women. What happened was that simultaneously, as we're all evaluating the tactics that we've had and whether or not we should continue to try to load up the court because it didn't seem to work. You also find out that there is this this specter out there of that abortion harms women. And by the way, as an ad, add to all of that, if the unborn are one of us and there's an industry that encourages women to kill their offspring before they're born, then if that's true, abortion hurts them, whether they psychologically realize it or not. And so the idea that abortion is a harm both to the life that's destroyed and to the life that is destroying it. I don't think that that's a huge leap or, or, or something that's difficult to understand how we got there. We observed it and we started to rec- and to put that into our language into our, as we sought laws to restrict it. It's kind of interesting how this is all, you know, couched as kind of like you were saying, like marketing strategies or different strategies based on things that happened, you know, whether it's court decisions and those kinds of things. And so was the original shift toward compassion for the women involved in abortion, you know, a response to the shift on tactic from the pro-choice advocates and, and changing audience. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's not, and it's a real weakness for this argument article, as I mentioned earlier, is that constant look at it as if it's a, it's happening in a vacuum. How do we understand the pro-lifers as if we're evaluating some animal in a zoo and trying to determine its behavior, as opposed to looking at it as part of a larger picture where both sides respond to the other. Now, it's easy to see that the reason that the, the, pro-life, the pro-choice side or the abortion advocate side started to change was because they found out that when we talk about the, bo- the unborn child, when there's a focus put on the life inside of the mother, then they lose. And so they said, how can we strengthen our argument? Let's focus on the place where the, the audience is most sensitive. And that's that women ought to have a right to make the choices in their life about their family and the things that they're going to do without the interference of the state. And that has that message had strong appeal. And so they very effectively began to focus on that message. And as that message changed the audience, because now the audience is thinking about the women. Now the pro-life side can't just argue about what the unborn is anymore. Now they have to effectively turn their attention to the woman and say, before we even discuss any of this, let's make sure that you understand that we're not anti-women and that we're not working against women, that we don't hate women and we don't want to prosecute women. And we're taking care of women and we're already doing all of these things. Now let's talk about what's being destroyed through the act of abortion. And so all of this movement back and forth is very cooperative and, and not, or, or at least responsive to the things that are going on between the opposition and the people caught in the middle of them, right? There's a large group of people in the United States that don't know what they think about abortion. And so both people on either side that are convinced of their position are constantly talking to them to win them over to their side. And as that audience hears new messages, then you have to change how you reach them. And as the environment or the culture changes, you have to change how you talk to them and the emphasis that you place on any particular subject matter. So yeah, it's all responding to each other. So do you think that there's been a broad shift away from seeing the woman as a second victim in recent years? No, I'm not a broad shift. I mean, I think that's the important thing. 
first of all, I don't think the absence of, in particular, the Mississippi law for Dobbs versus Jackson, the absence of abortion harms women, and that is an indication that of anything. It's just an indication that the they didn't need that in the way that they were making their arguments, and so they didn't appeal to that. When I think of people like uh, Live Action and Lila Rose, when I think of Abby Johnson, a very prominent pro-life voice out there, when I think of people like Students for Life of America, uh, more regional, Protect Life Michigan, and Kristen Polo, when I think of the group of We Dignify in Illinois, we're talking about organizations that are run largely by women. And every time I go and talk to these organizations, what I hear about is the compassion they have for the women involved and the ways in which they're trying to reach out to these women and help them to overcome what they've found and to restore even the women that have chosen abortion to right relations. I don't think it's been a broad place where we have abandoned women and changed our tactics. I think that you are not hearing about it as much on the, the legislature side, because I don't think where we are right now, it's required to make the arguments that you want to make. And, and largely because I think that it was, it probably didn't work as well on that side. So, so does the pro-life movement now marginalize women and see them as enemies that have had abortions? No, they're still doing everything they've always done. There's still pregnancy resource centers in almost every community in the United States that'll welcome in women who have had abortions and help them deal with the pain. If they're dealing with that sort of psychological or emotional pain, they'll help them to process it and deal with it. We still have massive, popular, influential organizations that a core part of what they're doing is helping women, both women who are thinking about abortion and women who have had abortions. What we're not doing is talking about it in the law as much anymore because it didn't work. It didn't get to where people wanted to get to. So as we've talked about before, responsive to what the audience is looking at, if your audience is the courts, how do you craft your, your argument in a way that the court will accept? If it didn't accept one, you craft it now in a new way. It doesn't mean any enmity is building between the pro-life side and the women that are getting abortions, although there are aspects of the pro-life movement or the abolitionist movement that will feel that, but it just means that it's just not working legally. So no reason to talk about it there. So is any of this, again, like a response to changing tactics from abortion advocates? I mean, they're saying that the tactics are being changed, but have they been changing their tactics? Yes, yes. That's a great point. They have changed again, right? So so let's go back to 1992, way back, for, for those of us who are older, it feels way back, but way back when President Clinton, then candidate Clinton, is talking about abortion being safe, legal, and rare. This, this idea of expressing regret over the idea that abortion exists, but it's necessary to protect the freedoms of women to make decisions for themselves. And so I'm personally opposed to the idea of abortion, but I'm also personally opposed to restricting abortion and restricting the freedoms of other people. That dominates all the way through, by the way, when then candidate Hillary Clinton is saying the same thing in 2008, safe, legal, rare. Okay. Safe, legal, and rare goes away. It starts to go away about 2012 or, or earlier than that. But in 2012, the Democratic Party officially removes that from their platform. No more. It's no longer a plank. We're not talking about safe, legal, and rare. Safe and legal, yes, not rare. Why? Because rare indicates a stigma attached to women who have had abortion. Saying we want it rare means that we think it's bad. And so any woman that's had it has to deal with this stigma. So get rid of rare. Go to 2015. I can't remember. Amelia, is that Amelia Bonau? Is that her name? Uh, yeah, Amelia Bonau, who starts the Shout Your Abortion movement and a Facebook post in 2015 where she shares the details of her abortion, says that she doesn't regret it at all, and it was great for her. And that starts the Shout Your Abortion movement. Go to 2017 and the Women's uh, March in Washington, D.C., and then all over the country, the accompanying marches that go with that, where they're wearing those hats that are meant to represent women's genitalia. Uh, and they're wearing short people are wearing shirts that say, Love abortion. I love abortion on there. There has been a move to get away from the idea that abortion is something that ought to be stigmatized from the other side and to proclaim it a good to be celebrated. And you see it not just at the political level and not just at the activist level, but you're also seeing it trickle down into so many ways into the entertainment level where you'll see women celebrating their abortion on television shows a way that they never did even five or six years ago. Uh, and so, yes, I mean, the idea of women no longer being the victims has probably been influenced or certainly has been influenced by the idea that there are a group of women at the activists or passionate levels of supporters for abortion rights that are declaring abortion a good thing, shouting their abortion, celebrating their abortion. 
uh, Martha Plimpton being one that talks about loving everyone. One routine that she gives her one place she's visiting. She loves this city. It's where she had her first abortion and everyone in the audience cheers. Yay. First abortion. We're, we're so proud to be the people that did that for you. So it's, it's a weird environment to embrace both this idea of shot your abortion, to turn around and say, odd, the pro-life people aren't talking about us like we're victims anymore. Well, no kidding. Well, you're not acting like victims right now. And so the idea of pressing this idea that you're innocent and that you've been duped by the abortion industry when you accused us of infantilizing you for saying that to begin with and have declared yourself proud of everything that you've done with absolutely no repercussions, either emotionally, psychologically or morally for, for the action against your unborn offspring. So I do think, sure. I mean, the other side has not been doing nothing or have been doing the same thing all along. They've changed. Now the pro-life movement's changing as well. It's really interesting because a few months ago, there were a bunch of stories from women who were clergy people, they were ordained, kind of doing the same thing, shouting about their abortion. One Mm -hmm. was a woman who wrote in, who is a pastor who wrote in the USA Today, I think she's married at the time that she had an abortion and how that was just a really good thing for her and her family. And then more recently in the Washington Post, the beginning of February, um, Reverend Kaylee McAvoy talked about she found out in 2016 that she was pregnant, she and her boyfriend at the time, and she felt that she was doing a holy act in getting an abortion. So it's very much of that shout your abortion type of thing, specifically with regard to some people in religious spaces because they feel like Roe v. Wade is being threatened. And so they want to be part of that movement. So it's interesting. So she goes on to write in this New York Times op-ed, Ziegler does, she says, quote, anti-abortion states have a decision to make. If they want to strongly enforce criminal abortion bans, they will probably have to go after women, end quote. So is there any possibility that, you know, some of the decisions that are going to happen this summer are going to build towards an aggressive prosecution of women getting abortions themselves. And maybe that's partially what's behind this shout your abortion or celebrate your abortion just to see, you know, kind of the face behind all the women getting abortions. They're just like you. Yeah. I I don't, I don't see it or see it. Yes. Ripley in different ways. Is it possible? I guess in the realm of possibility, particular municipalities could get out of hand. I don't see it happening though, because it's never happened. And there, and when you look at history, as far as the way that it, it was prosecuted in the United States. If you read Joseph Delapino's Dispelling the Myths of Abortion History, which is a massive book, and only somebody that's passionately interested in the subject matter would want to read that book. But he was a lawyer. He, he is modified in the sense that he thinks that abortion ought to be legal through the first 12 weeks, I believe, at the time that he wrote the book. But he, he goes through as a lawyer and a, a legal scholar and looks at the different laws. And what he says is that there's pragmatic reasons that women will never be prosecuted. And there are principled reasons and legal reasons and a lot of different reasons. Pragmatically, he said, as a district attorney, you're going to have a hard time gathering together a group of her peers and getting a prosecution out of them. And no district attorney or no prosecuting attorney anywhere wants to do that and wants to be put in a position that they're doing that all the time. And so you're not, pragmatically, you're not going to do it. He said, as a legal principle, it's going to be difficult to demonstrate that whatever happened happened to a living child, right? To In order to prove murder, if you want to go after that level of prosecution, you have to demonstrate that you both have the remains of the unborn life that died and that it was the act of abortion that killed it, right? Because the same process is oftentimes that you practice for abortion against a live baby, you practice against a dead baby that had died on a miscarriage, a natural miscarriage. And so how do you prove that that was an abortion versus how do you prove that it was the removal of an already dead life? He said, that's, that's a legal problem. And the other thing he says is at the end of the day, everybody had seen that the way you want to go after are the abortionists or like what Missouri is trying to do a pharmacist. If they get involved in all of this, they said, we're going to go after the people that are doing this. And to get those people, we're going to need the women to be able to help us find them. And so if the women become the targets of our prosecutions and we're never going to find the people that are actually guilty or responsible for doing this at a medical level, and those are the people that we're going to want to get. So there doesn't seem to be a record of that happening. And, and one thing I will say about the New York Times that I find in, 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 a, in, a, in a bunch of these articles they've released, they like to make the claim that states are aggressively already prosecuting women and they provide you links. 
I guess they think that most people don't look at those links or, or they have a different moral evaluation of what's delivered in those links. Uh, for example, they like to link to the state of New York where they say the state's pro- prosecuted her for something that she did while she was pregnant. Well, a woman was prosecuted because at 34 weeks of pregnancy, she was driving 50 and a 35, having drank at the same time of taking prescription medicine, crossed the line, ran headfirst into another car, killing the two people in it. She wasn't wearing her seatbelt. She went flying into the steering wheel. Her child was injured, born, and died six days later. And there is still some idea that there's still there was some discussion of whether or not she was texting while all this happened. Okay, well, that's not the, the state aggressively going after a woman that did nothing and intrusively getting into her life to prosecute her. There were real reasons to prosecute this woman, given the conditions that were set up as far as what actually happened. It's a tragic situation and the legal evaluation, they decided to prosecute her. It didn't ultimately stick because the child was unborn when it was injured. Let's go to another one that they like to talk about in South Carolina, where women were using cocaine, which was causing the premature death of their children. The hospitals figured out what was going on and they figured out there was a link to these particular types of uh, a placental previa that they were seeing and cocaine use. And so they started doing drug tests and then the law got involved again. This are not women where they was being intrusive. These are women that they're actively doing things that were killing their children. You may not like the involvement there, but these aren't innocent victims that were being, uh, you know, overly and aggressively prosecuted by the state in Florida. There was a woman who shot herself in the abdomen when she was six months pregnant for the purpose of killing her child. And so she was prosecuted for that. Uh, the, the prosecution, again, didn't stick because a higher court said that you can't prosecute her for something that she did to her unborn child. But again, these are not these, these are not the kind of cases that we're being told that they are. These are not women seeking abortions and the state's going after them. These are extreme cases of women doing reckless and crazy things that are ending in death. And so the idea they're being prosecuted isn't odd. The community is trying to figure out the best way to handle this. So there is no history of this. And the evidence that it's happening that's being provided by the New York Times themselves are these crazy cases. And I can go on, by the way, with other cases that they've linked to in the past that are no way indicative of normative behavior of women in any particular culture or society. Well, I just want to let our listeners know that Jay has an article coming up in our upcoming volume 45, number one and two issue about abortion. So we'll be talking to him again in the near future. But I want to ask more of a broad question because these decisions are coming up this summer. So if Roe v. Wade and Planned Parenthood v. Casey fall, what happens next for the pro-life movement? That is the question that everybody is interested to see where we go, right? Because a lot of things going to have to do with, and what was mentioned earlier with Missouri, how states are going to get along with each other. We're already seeing signs that states aren't going to get along with each other once this goes. So immediately if Roe goes, it, it, the, all the states will start, well, they have trigger laws. What they're allowed to restrict, they will immediately restrict. The state of Georgia has a trigger law. Florida has a trigger law. Uh, all these states are passing. Texas has, all these states have their laws that are immediately going to go into place. Other states, New York, California, Hawaii, these places that are planning on becoming play, uh, play, uh, 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 meccas for abortion are getting their laws ready. You have states like Virginia that's trying to do it. Michigan's getting ready to have a constitutional battle in their state over voting for it. So it goes back to the states if Roe v. Wade and Planned Parenthood versus Casey are directly overturned. And then it becomes a state battle. Why this becomes interesting is that for the first time in my life that I can remember – there will be a, there, we live in a world where conversations about abortion matter on a local level, that influencing your neighbor may influence your community, which may influence the laws in your area about how we're going to treat and approach abortion. And, and I think that you're, you're about to see, obviously, massive money poured into cities. In Georgia and Texas, we're already seeing it. Right? The Democratic Party is pouring tons of money into our states to try to turn them blue in advance of the things that we're seeing so that they can stem the tide of, of a Georgia losing the rights to abortion or Texas losing the, or, or regaining it in Texas the way they feel like they've lost it there. And the most important thing as far as all that would be that our, we have an active voice now in being able to make things happen in our community. And the most unknown thing is going to be how are states going to get along and what's going to happen between them? How will states 
feel about California trying to interfere with their abortion. Cal- Gavin Newsom has already said, we are your abortion destination. We're going to pay for you to come to our state to get abortions. This is the kind of thing Missouri is already looking forward to and saying, we don't want you paying for our people to leave our state and go to your state to get abortions. They're, they're trying to say, we will ship abortion medicine into your state. So how are states going to deal with each other? How are they going to get along? What, that's the question. The local government, you can already look and see what's going to happen. You either live in a red state or abortion-friendly uh, state or, 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 or abortion state that wants to restrict abortion. You can see that. If you're living in a battleground state, things are going to get ugly where you are as far as elections and laws. But all this means local government is going to matter in a way that it hasn't for for decades on this issue. And that that, to me, is fairly exciting. The idea of how the states are going to sort this out and what the national government is, and the laws that they're in are going to say about how we deal with each other, that's going to be a fascinating turn as well. Because right now, the trend is hostility between states, open hostility and, and irritation with the leadership between the states that disagree on this issue. Well, on a much lighter note, I finally have a fun rapid fire question for Jay. We do these so that listeners can get to know our authors a little bit better. Well, we just celebrated Easter. So does your family have any specific Easter celebration traditions or meals? You know, we, we, we don't, I don't know what it is about Easter. Our tradition, our strongest Easter traditions have to do with Lent. We're not Catholic, but we observe Lent. And so I'd say the strongest Easter traditions that we have have to do with the buildup to Easter. We're, my family and my kids are very serious about that. Uh, I think we probably did have, we had an Easter egg hunt we used to do with my wife's parents where my, my wife's parents would hide eggs, the plastic eggs, and all of them had change in them. And so the kids, even when they're in college are running out there finding eggs full of change and whatever reason, they just love that. But they're older now and they don't have the home that they used to have and COVID changed a lot of things. And so I would have to say at this point, no, outside of the preparation for Easter, we have a lot of traditions. Easter Sunday, we just sort of wing it. I mean, for us, it's just, let's be together. Well, thanks, Jay, for being a guest again on the Postmodern Realities Podcast. Thank you so much for having me on. It's always a pleasure. You've been listening to episode 284 of the Postmodern Realities Podcast. Today's guest was Jay Watts, who is the founder and president of Merrily Human Ministries, Inc. Jay has written an online exclusive article for the Christian Research Journal, rebutting a recent piece in the New York Times. And his article is called, What Attorney Mary Ziegler Gets Wrong About Pro-Life Tactics. And our subscribers can read it for free at our website, equip.org. Now, if you don't currently subscribe and you would like to get access to all of our online exclusives like this article by Jay, please go to our website, equip.org, to subscribe. 